Uh, we want to take a look at national security and there's absolutely no way we would do this without taking also a look at what the president announced as to be the person that will be advising him in terms with regards to national security. Uh, we're talking about the first, let me say the pioneer chairman of the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, EFCC, Nuhurim Badu, who uh, really held sway. Uh, his, his, his tenure really brought a lot of things to Nigeria, especially uh, when it came to the fight against um, issues around corruption. He was in office between 2003 and 2007. And now that he's been announced to be the special advisor to President Tinubu on, special, on, on security, we want to see where this would take us as a people, the people within the president's cabinet, kitchen cabinet, what kind of advice they should be given to him in, in tandem with what the people are expecting of the administration. Joining us this morning to take a look at this is the conflict advisor and security analyst, Mujidang Sidang. Thank you very much for being part of the program today. All right, I can't hear you. I, I hope you can hear me. All right, thank you. Okay, very yeah, good morning. Thank, thank you, you yeah. very much. Morning. Very well. Nice to have you on the show. Uh, Nigeria, since inception, has had to deal with one security issue or the other. But since 2014, the issues have taken a different dimension with the coming of Boko Haram and other terrorist organizations which seem to be finding uh, some, some land you know, suit, suitable for them in the country. Uh, now President Bola Tinubu has announced the name of the former EFCC boss as his special advisor on security. When the name came, let's start from there, what did that tell you with the possibilities of what we would get uh, when we deal with national security in the country? Well, I, I think, uh, first of all, it's quite uh, interesting, I mean, in the polity, considering all the appointments that have uh, so far been uh, outlined by the president. I think quite a lot uh, around the previous work uh, Malam Nuhur Bado has uh, achieved as the pioneer chair of the EFCC, and quite a lot around his personality. And of course, uh, his past record speaks a lot around the kind of personality he is. Mm -hmm. And so there's still, I mean, for me, that's very clear that people feel he could. But then the only, uh, I think, uh, the cloud around it is uh, the, the, the titling of this position as the special advisor on security rather than the usual national security advisor. So it's still unclear. I think people are really talking around on the streets. Is this the national security advisor in another form? Or is this another position uh, to replace it? Or it's a standalone position within the presidency? And uh, already analysts are saying probably this these chiefs would want to report directly to the president or how does this pan out to be? So there's quite a lot of excitement and anticipation around what would this role be? Is it directly to the presidency or to the service chiefs? or to, uh, the, as, as it used to be in the past. So there's, that's uh, quite in the air. But I mean, in terms of his personality, I think uh, from the antecedents in EFCC and all the other portfolios he had handled before and after EFCC, I think people are a bit comfortable that he knows the job. Uh, it's just uh, time now that will let us know how well he can achieve in this correct position. I'm mindful that national security is not just EFCC, uh, like one of the highest experiences we can see he has had. So managing Nigerian security sector, managing the Nigerian security space is quite a huge and Herculean tax. So it's quite interesting, but there's a lot of expectation from the citizens around this appointment. Well, the internet security, everybody knows that in Nigeria, the police is in charge. Uh, you find um, other security agencies, for instance, as army, which is supposed ordinarily to deal with the external aggression and so, so on and so forth, supporting the Nigerian police. And so when President, uh, former President Obasanjo appointed everybody at that time from the uh, police force, it wasn't anything very new to a lot of people. But to many people, uh, the position of a security advisor in the present day Nigeria, facing the realities that we have on the ground, uh, they were looking at the choice of Nuhuri Badu. 
Uh, if you look at him now, he's been chosen already by the president. What are those immediate tasks that you would say are ahead of him? And do you think there are ways that this can be handled? Well, I think uh, one of the major things people would watch out to see is how does he actually achieve this coordination amongst the security uh, sector? I mean, between the military and uh, the police and other paramilitary agencies. Because as we speak now, and I mean, down deep to even community security forces, because as we speak now, Nigeria is being managed by a coalition of all the security actors, including both the government ones and the ones that communities have established. People who want to see how well he can coordinate from that government security sector to even the ones that communities are coming up with to protect themselves. So for me, his cap capacity to coordinate around the security sector we have in the country would be very paramount to the expectation of a lot of Nigerians. And it will also interest you to know that there's going to be a lot of, of, of expectation from Nigerians around his ability to ensure that across these several regions, there's calm uh, over his appointment. And of course, that means people would want to see immediate results or they want to see a clear pathway of how the security challenges would be addressed. And it shouldn't be business as usual. When people are arrested, we need to see the entire process of arrest, charging to court and all that happening. Otherwise, it will be like everyday thing. So people are expecting to see that all the, we have all the policies, we have all the processes of handling security in place. So his appointment and the expectation I think people would have is that let's all see all those things that are in place being actioned. So if they are arrested, are they charged to court? And if they are, is the uh, the, 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 the legal uh, space also doing its part of the job? And if so, it's also our correctional services keeping these people where they need to be. But above all, I think there's going to be some form of, uh, I mean, reform across sectors that people's expectations need to be met with action. Otherwise, it will be just, uh, I mean, as, you, as we used to see in the past, so the expectation is to see what are those things he has to put in place that there would be immediate, even though the, some of these changes could be long term, but the expectation is that let it be immediate. What are those things that can be achieved immediately? We want to see them happening. And of course, that sense of being secure in your country should, I mean, immediately start getting back to us. People should feel secure when they move out of their homes. People should feel secure when they go to their workplace. And people should feel secure when they sleep at night. I mean, if he decides to do that, I guess that coordination should help. And that's what a lot of people are expecting. And even across the security sectors, he needs to also dialogue across that sector, ensure that that rivalry is no longer, I mean, a disadvantage to the security sectors. I mean, you can take that out, but how well that is managed to the advantage of national security would be one of, one of the things that we'll be watching out for. Uh, Muchidang, if, if you take a look at the fact that most of the things we see come into the internal system, uh, which is where people say, well, police is very important at this point in time. You see the emergence as Nuri Ribadu as a special advisor to President Tinubu, um, bring, bringing into reality the uh, call for community policing in the country. Well, you know, so from the crafting of the title as special advisor of security, or whether it's going to be national security advisor, I think the presidency is also thinking of how well to situate this uh, position. But I mean, in terms of community policing, and naturally that has evolved, uh, whether we like it or not, because communities at one point or the other had to form themselves into an organized group to protect themselves. A case in point is not East Nigeria where the CJTF had to take charge of part of the security the, 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 of themselves. So for me, that is evolving. And if you go around the country, several groups, whether organized or not organized, are already trying to mobilize to protect themselves. So that's, for me, an opportunity that the, as a national security advisor, a, a special advisor on security, that he can tap into. That's why I said there's need to co be coordination. So it's not just the regular government security forces now. There's a need to cascade it down to those at community level. You should find a way to also budget for those local security or community security 
and find a way to ensure that they are also managed and provided with codes of conduct so that they don't also go overboard. So there's a need to look at a holistic security approach. And each time that narrative comes, people tell us, even the citizens are responsible for their security. Now the citizens have mobilized. The government needs to ensure that all the strata of security that are available in the country are involved in the security management of the country. And being, for me, that's basically developing or working on an already existing template of community policing. So there's a need to do that. We shouldn't shy away from the fact that it has come to a point where our security agencies cannot alone manage the security in the country. There's a need to cascade it down. And of course, youths and communities are already offering themselves for that. And to a larger extent, we've seen some of the successes across what they've done. So it's an opportunity that the government needs to tap into. But you can't tap into that if you don't plan to also include them in your general master plan of how security architecture should be managed. I mean, all eyes on the present administration to see if community, community policing, which one would say in another way would bring about state policing would come into being. Now, uh, because of the um, emergence of all kinds of terrorist organizations around the country, our neighboring countries, we had to go into uh, a lot of alliances, joint task force, and what have you with other nations uh, within the sub-region. Uh, in what ways would you like to see this administration improving on the existing relationships with, be, be, between us and other countries alike to improve our border areas so that we can feel safer within? Yeah, so, I mean, like a response to the insurgency in the Northeast, uh, you've seen how Nigeria has actually advanced in working with all our neighboring countries, um, ensuring that we have this joint security tax force in place and working on the multinational joint tax force and the rest of those. But I think there's a need to now, I mean, deliberately uh, target working and also clearly defining and managing and patrolling our borders. Yes, we are into those security alliances, but when this crisis quails down, who is managing those borders? I think our borders are still porous. So besides just coming when there's security issue to jointly do those tax forces and respond to it, there's a need to constantly manage these borders and ensure that we are safe from our borders, that no intruder is coming into our country to cause issues. And even when people from the country cause any form of issues, they are stopped at the border and they are also charged for those. So besides just responding to this crisis through those multinational joint tax forces and all sorts of arrangements that continue to protect our borders with our neighboring uh, our, our other country neighbors, I think there's a deliberate need to ensure that we manage our borders. Yeah, and it's a huge challenge considering how, the, how porous our borders are at the moment. So there's a need to deliberately look at that. And of course, part of the narrative around some of the conflicts we have is that there are a lot of foreigners coming in to commit crime. Probably some of them would be machineries that have been hired to just come and do their job and get paid. So how are we managing these borders? It's a huge tax for this administration. We need to ensure that within the Nigerian space, people are safe. At our borders, people are checked. Nothing should go in and out of Nigerian border without being checked. I keep saying it, it's going to be a huge tax for the administration, but they'll have to do it if they want to earn the trust of Nigerians. There's no way we won't talk about uh, the security agents themselves, uh, from the police to the military to paramilitary and what have you. Uh, what, what, what role would you say they have to play in ensuring that we improve our national security? Well, I would still go back to coordination. I mean, like we all say, internal security is the police, and of course, other external aggressions are to be addressed by the military. But our, our, our constitution has also clearly stated that if there is a need for the military to be called in, they need to be on ground. And of course, that's why we have them almost in every state of our country. So that coordination needs to keep happening. We need to be very clear in terms of how this coordination is managed, I, I would have said, I, I think there has been some improvement in the last couple of years, but there's a need to do more because much is expected from the security agencies. And of course, now that communities are even willing to help, I think it should make the job of coordination easy. But the government needs to clearly point out to this direction where we need to head, and then the security agencies Put need to on coordinate the spot. and work together to achieve that. 
let, let me put you on the spot a little bit, if you don't mind. Uh, what would be your scorecard for the present security chiefs? Uh, regards to fighting terrorism in the country. Remember what it was like before they were eventually uh, appointed by the former president? Well, I, I, I think uh, I would say, I mean, they've done to a certain level some, I, I mean, there's been some clear achievement, but what they've done has actually bring some relative peace to some areas, even though, like we all know, the conflict has a very funny uh, kind of uh, strategy. I mean, in itself, it has evolved. It has moved from one location to the other. And of course, we also know the capacity of our military. So we shouldn't analyze the security chiefs just based on individual instructions they give or, or the commands they give or the dole out. We should do that looking at what's the strength of the armed forces we have in our country. Do we have the adequate numbers to do the job we desire? Or we are just saying this person is appointed and he needs to perform magic. So it's also time for the government to also consider, are these numbers enough? Are the equipments enough to address the security challenges? We compared with other climbs and we find out that we are not yet there in terms of the numbers, the technology. So if we were to grade them, we would say they've done fairly good because of what they have at hand. But if there's a lot of support in logistics, training, retraining, and coordinating engagement between the security forces and communities, I think they would have done much better. So let's not just rate people based on their appointment, but what has the government offered for the job to be done? If it's been enough and they fail, then we can say this, there has been a failure. But let's look at that side by side. So for me, I think they've done fairly well, and there's a need to improve around that. Now, I know you're not the presidential spokesperson, but I remember that during the campaign of uh, President Balatunubu, he did promise to shore up the number of uh, security personnel across the country. Um, are you looking forward to that? And uh, if you say the ratio of the police personnel, let me say even security personnel to uh, the numbers of Nigerians, over 200 million at this point in time, some way, may say maybe they are way below the number um, needed to ensure that we're safe and secure as a nation. Are you looking at this happening in some days to come, perhaps weeks? Well, I, I, I think that could happen in, in, in a couple of months. But I mean, there are several ways to manage this with the advancement in technology. You can actually use technology to do a lot of things that probably if you needed 200 officers and technology can serve, I mean, you can police 800 with that number that you have. So it's left for the government to choose which is the best way to approach this. If you install cameras, for instance, in major cities, I mean, it takes off the burden of keeping fiscal police to police almost every street. So are we thinking that? What's the long-term benefit? What's the cost effectiveness of doing that? So the government needs to look at strategies and methods that are working across the globe. There are several ways of policing now. You don't need to get 1,000 policemen to just guard a street. You can have cameras, you can have mobile units, you can have, uh, I mean, uh, response teams that will respond to issues that arise in communities. And looking at the structure of even working with community policing, you can have these community units also help you, I mean, do some of the policing work. So it's not just the numbers, but the quality of what we have. Are we ready to train? Are we ready to build on what we have? Are we ready to in involve huge technology into policing and, of course, in our safety and security sector? I mean, for me, those are the things that we should look at. I mean, have technology, spend more on trainings and retrainings, and build also for the current ones. Ensure they are also comfortable. Are they comfortable where they are? Are their quarters enough? Are the logistics in place? I mean, if you improve those, I think we would see some significant change in our policing. Uh, you know, we have to round off now. Really enjoying this conversation with you. But uh, in just 30 seconds, the man who Ribadu, who will be talking to the president closely, advising him on taking vital national security decisions. Uh, you want to comp uh, let's take a look at his person, his idiosyncrasies, and the job at hand. You see him performing as he did with the EFCC, something better. Uh, what are those things you're looking for to get him from him? Well, I would speak like every 
Nigerian, we have huge expectations on this regime. And of course, that trickled down to someone like Rubadu. There's a lot of expectations, and we would want him to outperform himself uh, as, uh, when he was in EFCC. So there's a lot of expectations, and I'm joining other Nigerians to expect that we need to see changes immediately. So I'm expecting a lot from him, like every other Nigerian, I think, and we hope that the regime would support all those that have been appointed to actually do the work they are meant to do. There should be some free hand for people to actually engage and implement the, the, those rules they've been assigned by government. So for me, the expectation is quite high. All right, Moji Dang, C. Dang, Conflict Advisor, Security Analyst. We thank you for your time and thoughts on the show. Can't wait to have you back. Still a lot of things to talk about when it comes to national security. We thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.